I'm pleased to welcome you to the Friends of the Key West Library's second free virtual lecture of the 2021 season, featuring writer and naturalist Susan Cerulean in conversation with Key West food critic series author Lucy Burdett, known to us as Friends of the Key West Library President Roberta Islip. I'm Wendy Niven, the Vice President of the Friends. The Friends was organized to provide financial and volunteer support for the activities of the Key West Public Library. We raise money through memberships, book sales, and donations. All money raised through our memberships go to the support the library's annual wish list, including staff training, children's library services, and special purchases to support the library's mission. Please consider joining the Friends. Before we begin, I'd like to share some tips about our Zoom webinar. Unlike Zoom meetings, you won't be seen or heard during this session. However, at the bottom of your screens, you'll find both a chat and a Q&A button. The chat button allows you to share comments with your fellow attendees. There, you'll also find a link to purchase Susan's books and join or donate to the friends. The Q&A button allows you to suggest questions for our moderators to present to the panelists before the end of the session. So with that, I would like to introduce Friends President Roberta Islip. Please join me in welcoming Roberta and Susan for tonight's conversation. I am just thrilled to introduce to you Susan Cerulean. She is, I'll probably call her Sue from time to time if I forget. She's a writer, a naturalist, and an advocate based in Tallahassee, Florida. Her latest book is I Have Been Assigned the Single Bird, a Daughter's Memoir, which she just heard last week has been shortlisted for a Sartan Award. In 2015, her book Coming to Pass, Florida's Coastal Islands in a Gulf of Change won a gold medal Florida Book Award. Her nature memoir, Tracking Desire, A Journey After Swallowtailed Kites, was named an editor's choice title by Audubon Magazine. She has written and edited many other books as well and fights hard to uh, save the wild things of our world. And most important to me, she is my treasured older sister and roommate for many years. So we welcome you, Sue, Susan. Here she is. <laughs> I'm probably gonna be calling your, your esteemed president, Roberta, Bobby, because I can't seem to change at this point. That's all right. <laughs> so all right. What, uh, what we thought we'd do tonight is I have some questions to ask uh, Susan about writing and writing this book, but I, I also wanted her to read to you a few little short excerpts that fit in, and she has put together some slides that will help illustrate what she's talking about. So we will uh, dive right in. So will you start by telling us what was life like before you hatched the idea for this book, I have been assigned the single bird. Okay, that's the quick picture of us when we were young. Um, I was writing books about nature in Florida and I was working as a wildlife biology at the state agency, State Wildlife Agency here in Tallahassee. And in particular, I had begun spending a lot of time, as much time as I could on our North Florida coast, uh, especially St. Vincent Island. So here you're looking at um, the panhandle where it kind of dips down and there's a chain of islands. And this one here, if you can see that, is um, St. Vincent Island, and that's where we spend most of our time. And this is what it looks like from Indian Pass. It's very beautiful. We were also at launching our teenage sons and making the transition to an empty nest. When um, this, I'm going to read you uh, just very short excerpts, and I'll begin here. This is chapter one, diagnosis. Something is wrong, Sue. My father's face is a wrinkled up question. I step past a sliding glass door onto the small garden patio. 
A fragrant veil of smoke and spattering of meat brought a flash of comfort, reminding me of the many cookouts we'd shared when our family was young. My sister Bobby and I had converged at our father's house from our own homes in Connecticut and Florida. In the kitchen, Bobby sliced summer tomatoes and sweet onions. I'll go keep him company, I had said to her. But dad was bent oddly over the flames. A pair of tongs and a spatula extended his reach like the right and left claws of a blue crab. He had lit squares of charcoal, which glowed in a tiny heap, tidy heap on the bottom of the grill, all good. But my father had laid the raw hamburger patties directly on the coals. He had forgotten to use the rack that suspended the meat above the flames, and he could not puzzle out what had gone wrong. He clacked unfruitfully at the meat with his implements. I stood at the grill beside my dad, caught between nervous laughter, could this be a joke, and horror. It wasn't. Something is wrong, Sue, he said. On that day, my sister and I began to square with our new reality. And I remember that, I remember that scene so well, it was heartbreaking. <laughs> it was heartbreaking. I also remember when Mary Jane, our stepmother, uh, said to me, he can't understand the date, a date anymore. He couldn't figure out what would it have been, uh, what, what year was it? 1996, whatever it was, he yeah. didn't understand that, how to figure out the, uh, the year. So dad is getting a little worse. His dementia is getting worse. He has been hit by a car. So that's taken a lot out of him. And then suddenly Mary Jane dies and all hell breaks loose. So you and Jeff, somebody had to step up and take care of him and you and Jeff decided you could handle that. So tell us about that. Well, there were four of us kids and um, we just seemed to be the ones that were in place the most. And we really, we had an uh, ultimately unrealistic vision of how it would be to care for dad in Tallahassee. I think that I thought um, that if I took care of all the things that Mary Jane hadn't been able to get to because she was older, that we could stabilize him indefinitely. And we were, of course were wrong about that, even though there were, there were plenty of sweet times, but any of you all who have taken care of a, a spouse or a, an elder with Alzheimer's know that it's, it, it doesn't go, you don't return to where you were Okay, so you were, uh, you were starting to write about him then and also writing about the natural world or tell us how you thought about putting those two things together. Well, I was um, trying to keep my, my job. Um, parts of it were volunteer at this point and some of it, some of it was paid and it all had to do with uh, keeping track of birds on our coast, brown pelicans, and uh, finding nests and staking them out so that they wouldn't be disturbed by people walking on the beach. This is a set of American oyster catcher nests. But it was harder and harder to be away from, from dad, from what was going on here, even, even with the extra help we hired. And we were lucky that we could afford, dad could afford for us to um, hire as many, as much staff as we could manage. Um, but with this, with this kind of, a, of an illness, there's always a surprise around the corner. And um, so I spent a lot of time sitting in his room um, and since I'm a writer, I was, I was taking notes and um, I started looking out the window and in this part of Florida, probably, I don't, I don't think you have this problem in the Keys at all, but we've got um, 
an invasive vine that's called kudzu. And it's this enormous green snaking thing that takes over trees. And there was one of those uh, right outside the window of the facility where dad was staying. And I just began to make the connection between what that vine was doing in terms of smothering those, those, that natural forest and what the tangles and plaques in dad's brain were doing to him. So that was something that, you know, only came to me, I guess, because of the kind of work I did. But at the same time, I would be toggling, going back and forth between the coast and looking what was happening, what was threatening the birds down there. And I kind of came up with uh, the corollary at that point. And this is something that I wrote. The earth is the brain and the body into which we were born. In some nearly parallel way, we face not only a crisis in numbers of people diagnosed with dementia. As a culture, we are stricken with the disease and its attending violence. Why else would we knowingly destroy the planet that sustains our very lives? Our Western economic and political systems. These are the illnesses that are killing our planet. When you have the physical disease as an individual, you experience it alone. But our cultural dementia, we are in this together. What is our part? What can each one of us do to alter the trajectory we ride? How can we bring healing to this world? My deepest desire regarding both my father's illness and the Earth's biosphere and biodiversity was to save, to rescue, to ensure continuance. And for many years, I thought I could. So in my field work, I was doing, as I mentioned, bird counts, uh, Christmas bird counts, breeding bird surveys. And what we know now is that we've lost nearly 3 billion individual wild birds since 1970. And I was just at the, at the bottom of that curve in 2010. Um, and the trouble is that the population losses aren't restricted to rare and threatened species, but include many that are widespread or we think of as widespread and common. And shorebirds, who, which I particularly adore and are the subject of this book, are experiencing really, really enormous declines because of rising sea level. And so there's, there's less uh, habitat for them to nest and to rear their chicks. Um, but also because we like to go to the beach and we don't realize that um, they need us to give them some space. So I was coming to grips with the crisis in extinction and then also looking at climate change and sea level rise. And my husband, Jeff, is a climate scientist. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about uh, what we're seeing a forest near Cape Sandblast that has been uh, knocked back by salt from sea level rise. And what we, what, we, what we know is that our atmosphere with carbon dioxide levels that haven't been seen in, in 15 million years, that means that our atmosphere is becoming novel for our species. And we have learned, haven't we, all of us, how dreadful a novel threat can be. So climate change, species extinction, uh, if these aren't cultural dementia, um, then I don't know what is. And it's, a, it's the tragedy that we fail to understand our true inseparability from nature, which includes all races, all species, all of the earth, not just us. So that's where I was coming to put things together. And one of the things that amazes me about the writing that you do is it's a very different process than what I do to write a mystery. So yeah, I couldn't write a memoir because I don't keep notes, whereas you have written things down forever. And you also had some of the caregivers 
journals as well, right? I did. Um, well, the thing is, I can't write fiction. I cannot make up something to save my life. Um, I've written about almost everything I can think of in the nonfiction genre around my part of Florida. And my husband said last night, why don't you write a short story? I just, nothing comes. But I, I admire that so much about you. The only way I can get myself going in terms of um, writing these, well, there's two ways. One is taking notes, like you said. And being with dad, he was just, he was just so funny a lot of the times. It, it, this sounds like a grim story, but really we, um, we had a lot of good laughs with him and just Bobby and I talking back and forth to each other. Uh, I learned to do some of my writing um, using Natalie Goldberg's Writing Down the Bones, free writing way back in the 80s. And because of that, I got in the habit of trying to um, generate at least three pages in these kinds of journals every day, uh, most days. And so those are, the, those are the things I rely on, free writing and just observing what I see in the natural world or in this case with our father <laughs> who liked, who really liked to be the center of attention. He, he liked for me to write down his, his things he said. <laughs> he was a very funny fellow. He, he hated being single. We hate to even tell you how many times he was married, but he <laughs> reminds us that three of his wives died, so he shouldn't be held responsible for those. <laughs> But he, uh, he was single when Sue was taking care of him because Mary Jane had just died. So he was watching everybody in his orbit to see who might be next. Now, Sue was there on the scene, but I was the money guy. So he would call up and say, um, Bob, I need some money. Say, Dad, what do you need it for? You're, everything's covered where you are. Your food, everything's taken care of. Well, then he would get grumpy. I don't have to tell you what it was. Well, it was for a ring. But he wasn't sure which lady he was going to <laughs> propose to. <laughs> so that's when, when people say to me, that book sounds so depressing. It's it's dementia, it's climate change, it's how we're ruining the world. I just can't read something like that right now. And I say, but he was funny and Sue was able to capture uh, his personality. Yeah, I would say it's worth reading the book just to um, get an inside view into his, um, his sweet, but straight ahead gonna do it uh, relationship with a, one of the caregivers that I had hired that was half his age. And you know, she was beautiful. Yeah. I'm gonna share just a little bit about, about what, it wasn't just him around that place. On the porch of the landing, which was the, the care facility that we had gotten him a room in. And the reason we didn't have him in our own house is because the kind of dementia that he had is, was a Parkinson's variant. And so his brain was pretty functional for a long time, really in some ways up until his death. But his body wasn't something, you know, he, he, where it affected him was in, in his limbs and using his body. So on the porch of the landing, men and women gathered in oversized green rockers to enjoy the end of the day. And that's often when I would go and sit with him. Tall, bald Roscoe pushed through the front door and headed toward a potted hibiscus on the sidewalk. Where's your babe magnet? Asked another resident, referring to Roscoe's dog, Tigger, who often occupied the laps of resident ladies. Roscoe didn't answer until he had pinched a single crimson blossom and tucked it behind his ear. In Hawaii, this means you are available, he grinned. And all these people are in their 80s to late 90s, where we'll all be one day. And we don't stop getting interested in love, is what the lesson I learned. He aimed his remark at no one in particular, except I noticed a pink flush on the cheeks of one quiet old woman across the porch. 
That Roscoe is cutting in on my territory, Dad grumbled in my ear as the banter continued. I wonder if the same woman had caught my own father's eye. There's a lot of drama around here, Dad, I said. It's slow moving, he replied. I dialed up my sister Bobby on my cell, and as was often the case, Dad turned the conversation to the perennial problem of romance. The Landings Recreation Therapist, red-haired and curvy, stopped to greet us on her way home. Dad's smile opened, broad as a wedge of cantaloupe. The young woman rested a hand on his shoulder. Don't forget, Bob, she said, sitter sizes tomorrow morning at 10. I want you to come join us. Dad tiptoed the fingers of his left hand up her forearm. Gently, she disengaged and blew him a kiss. How kind she is, I said. You should go to her exercise class, Dad. She sounds great, said Bobby through the speaker phone. She could stand to lose a few pounds, our father said. Dad, that is not your business. Dad, have you ever had a relationship with a woman who is just a friend? Bobby was exasperated. You can't divorce the two, friendship and love, said Dad. There you go, said Bobby. You've put your finger right on the problem. How old would you say she is, asked Dad, ignoring my sister's counsel. About 28, I guess. God almighty, yelped my dad. Even he knew a woman in her 20s was too young for him. My sister and I chuckled. Why are you two being so selfish, said Dad. I'm allowed to fall in love. She's my daughter's age, Dad, said Bobby. Pursuing her is out of the question. Always, always the killjoy. <laughs> <laughs> the other, another thing that made it fun was that my dad, my dad is on the right. Our dad is on the right in this picture, and on the left is his brother, who's uh, younger by four years, I think. And they were best of friends, just like my sister and I are. And so Uncle Don kept up with Dad every night on the phone, and and that really made it. Um, it made it a lovely family affair as best it could. Also, he was just a really fun father. This was us when we were probably like one and two or less. And he was just, you know, he was somebody that had put in the time and given to us and now we wanted to share back. And, Oh, did you have a the section about Uncle Don that you wanted to read? Because we have time. Oh, well, let me see. You have to dig through. Later in the evening, I tilted back in a black ladder back chair next to my father's bed, my feet propped on his on his the frame of the bed. The voice channeled through the speakerphone on the nightstand was Uncle Don, my father's little brother, 77, to Dad's 82. What have you got on your calendar this week, Rob? I've got to make contact with my three paramours, Don, said Dad. You know, I've got these various love interests and I don't want to make a mistake. For me, our age differences seem to fade away, but I don't think the objectives of my interest are so sure about that. Uncle Don replied, maybe you should just cool it for a while. Take it easy. His voice carried not a scrap of judgment. I can't last forever, Don said dad. He lay back on his bed, eyes shut, hands folded over his chest. The corners of his mouth curved in a foxy grin which made me smile in turn. And I admire that dedication, replied my uncle who had been married to only one woman compared to my father's five wives. But it sounds exhausting to me. It reminds me of the last half mile to Camp Yawcock, all uphill. So unless you have something else you wanna get into, um, I thought it might be helpful to go back to the natural world and talk a little bit about what people who are listening, what they should be watching for and whether there are things they can do to make a difference in the dementia. 
I'd be, I'd be happy to. Um, I wanted to say that, uh, just begin by saying that this extremely adorable little guy is a snowy plover chick and they're, they're highly endangered and yet very capable if given the space. And to me, um, they were one of the birds that I, I, I was keeping track of in the years that I did that. And sometime in there, I was, I was thinking about how hard it is to, the title of the book kind of came to me. I have been assigned this single bird. And it was clear that, and I know that everybody feels this way, the frustration of having a big ambition to save the bird, save the world, save my father, whatever it is that you care about. And some people actually do save things. People who recovered endangered species or acquire and protect large swaths of landscape from development or perform, perform heart surgery or heal a broken leg. There, there is some saving that can be done, but not all of us are gonna do something that we can measure in that way. And I think that what we're seeing right now um, we, uh -oh. somebody's alarm clock is going off. <laughs> um, what we're seeing right now is that our single efforts are not going to be enough. What we're going to, what we're going to have to move towards is societal change in a big way. And some of what's happening now on the political level is um, a reversal of all the things that we lost the last four years, like the Endangered Species Act, the protections for grizzly bears, protections for the bird, Bears e Ears National. Um, I don't know what that beeping is, but I don't think it's me. So, I guess what I want, wanted to say to you is that um, the changes that have to be made are global. Just like we need a, a vaccine for a virus and we need something that will ultimately enable us to get into the Alzheimer's um, disease process, we have to be able to get into the, um, the, the political, social, uh, ways of doing business that we've, we've gone about in, in years past. So if you're looking for something specific to do, I think it's best um, to join up with another, with a group, with somebody who's doing what you're interested in. If you're interested in climate change, which is really the most difficult thing we've got going on, um, there are many, many groups, 350.org, local groups. What in the world is that? I do not know what that is. I'm so sorry if it's me. <laughs> you know, hang on. <laughs> now I hope you all are thinking of questions for Sue because shortly we're going to be inviting Emily Berg in who's going to be fielding them. Did you figure out I'm what gonna, it was? Yes, I did. And I, this is just the funniest thing. This clock was my father's clock. <laughs> I had it beside my bed for all the years since, he's, since he died, which has been about seven or eight. I had it out here in the living room because it was broken and it was going out to the recycle. And I have never heard it go off. But it just did. Now, is that serendipity or what? No, that's a message from <laughs> you know who. <laughs> I am so sorry. But it's just really the way it was. He wanted to be part of the conversation. Okay, so just go back about what you were saying, uh, climate change and... Okay. Um, I think it's really important to find a local group or a national group that you can support with your effort, your political phone calls, um, your contributions. That, that's essential because 
even if we do things like um, after this virus is over, if we fly less ourselves, if we buy an electric car instead of um, a gas, a gas powered car, it's going to take a much bigger effort to make the reductions in CO2 in the atmosphere that we need to make in order for our children's children to have a livable planet. So somehow finding your way into um, climate change is really important. I think um, that something that I've been telling people, if you have even the smallest place where you can put in a native plant, um, I know that's hard in, a, in an apartment in Key West or in a city, but the smallest plant that would be useful to pollinators who ultimately run this whole planet is, is an incredibly useful and satisfying. And um, so you can start from that kind of level and then move, move up to the much bigger um, issues of our time. But that's a big one too. I think it's also really important to um, get to know the place where you live and um, what, it's, what it was like before um, people and concrete took over and, and connect with that and, and know where you are on the planet and what its needs are. Um, car, so what, what we're gonna need to do as a group are things like um, figure out carbon offsets, figure out renewable energy, uh, replacing um, coal-fired power plants. And you would think that that would be obvious, but it really does require all of us letting our elected officials know that that's what we want. And so I know we all just finished a lot of work uh, trying to impact this election that we just had, but it's really in terms of the ultimate um, situation on the planet, we can't quit now. So that's, I think that's what I'd say, and I'm happy to pin it down a little more if anybody else, if anybody wants me to. Okay, uh, I have a question that's in a little different vein, which is since we're uh, friends of the library and we're supporting our library and that's our mission, I asked the women from last week, and maybe I can ask you too, is, do you have a story from growing up that describes why libraries are important to you? Well, I, I think to me, um, we had a really nice public library in Berkeley Heights, New Jersey, where we grew up. And um, our mother would take us there. I think we surely went once a week. At least and, once a week. Yeah, it was the main way that we... Um, we got the stuff that we read, even though our parents were really good about buying us books. But what I remember looking for and wanting um, were biographies of women, like um, Rachel Carson. And um, I, there weren't that many role models that had books about them then. So what we would what we would what we would check out would be Nancy Drew and um, other intrepid girl models. So I think that for these times when we're trying to figure out, um, when young people really need to be having the stories that, that could give them the models they need. Television is great. It was so fun to watch um, that our new inaugural poet laureate, young woman reading her amazing poem on election day, but there's really nothing like the written word. And so um, I just think about taking your grandchild or other somebody else's children or grandchildren to the library and get stacks of books that will help them feel empowered in ways that they need. That's what libraries did for me. Okay. Um. Do you want to add anything before we invite Emily to come forth and no, see if we have some questions? I'd be happy to see if there are any questions. Okay. So Emily should magically appear. 
There she is. She's doing it. Emily, <laughs> Emily is the manager of Books and Books and also our on our uh, lecture series committee. Yeah, and that was wonderful. And um, we do have a couple of questions, but I just wanted to start off by saying there's been some people sharing in the chat their stories of their family members mm -hmm. with dementia. And it's been really nice. I wanna just read one, cause I know you guys can't really keep an eye on that as well. But um, Denise Ann Terry wrote, I enjoyed the book very much. My stepfather was a darling, funny guy who lived to be 93 years old. His brand of dementia manifested as utter confusion about most things and complete clarity about others. One of the last times I saw him, he said, you have a long trip, you better get started. He oh. was right. He recognized me until the end and I loved him so much. Thank you for writing about the mixed picture of dementia. So that's, I thought that was very nice. That sounds very that's, familiar. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so kind of on that same note, we have one question here. Um, do you have other siblings and were they on board um, with you writing about your father? Good question. Well, did I ask them? <laughs> I think I told them. Um, they they knew. But tell them we have two. We have two. We have a, a younger brother and a, and a younger sister. And um, they came down to Florida. They both live, one in Maryland and one in the, in the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Their lives really didn't allow them to participate very much at all in dad's care unless I really had a need to get away for a little bit, uh, you know, a week or something. Uh, but people, every no, everybody was was very supportive. They didn't really know exactly. They knew the stories because we shared them of what was going on, um, but they didn't see it as a whole until until it came out. And everybody's fine with it. Everybody's still speaking. <laughs> What'd you say? We're everybody's still, still speaking. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, that was a question that I had too, is did you worry about how you were presenting someone and whether they would take offense? Because it's your point of view, it's in yeah. your head. Yeah, um, the thing that I knew was that dad, dad would, would have approved of, he did, you know, we were fully discussing these things and his, his was the opinion that mattered the most to me. Um, my uncle Don too, um, I was a little bit worried about whether he felt like I would, that would be, you know, I'd be representing things, but we have a pretty um, open family and we kind of know where, where uh, everybody's headed and and tease each other a lot. So I don't think it, there were any real big surprises in there at all. Um, I wanted, I, it was important to me that, that the caregivers feel that I represented them well and that we so appreciated them. Um, but I, for, for other writers out there, I think you know that um, writing is kind of a fragile thing. You, uh, you don't know how it's going to be received and you don't always feel completely confident that you've done something that will be useful or you know feel feel good to people out there in the world and so i never felt um concerned about the what i was reporting about what i saw in with the birds but yeah i worried a little bit but not that much also, my press was very, um, they, they, they went through things with me from a legal angle and they just made sure that any names or facility names that needed, to, that should be changed were, and I did, I, I did that. Wonderful. Um, we have a couple other questions coming in. Um, well, one from Marsha, uh, she says, my mother who had dementia told me the most wonderful stories about her youth because she some days thought she was still young. Did your father tell you any stories um, that you had not known before he got dementia? He did, he really did. Um, our mother died um, when we were in our 20s and there were things uh, that we just didn't know about, about what was going on with her. And he occasionally would come out with something that kind of pointed me 
in the right direction to understand what had happened to her. But um, it was more of a hint than anything else. He couldn't really do a full conversation. But he also, um, he came up with memories from World War II that were extremely detailed and touching. His memory worked really well for his wartime. So we got a lot of information uh, about his experience uh, liberating a small town in France. And um, that, was, that was really cool. But one of, the, one of the neatest things was at the very end, probably you know, just weeks before he died, um, I was in there and it was December and it was dark early and it was just kind of a, um, I don't know, it was, it was, it had, a, the night had a sort of a sacred feel to it, like the solstice does and Christmas does. And um, we were sitting there and we had kind of lowered lights and just kind of being together. And all of a sudden he kind of jerked his head up and said, he started talking. And um, I said, who are you talking to dad? And he said, that's my mom over there. And she's standing at the door. And what I don't know is whether she's telling me to come or to stay. And if, if, if I had ever thought about, you know, uh, the crossing over experience between light, life and death, I couldn't have come up with a, um, a more realistic um, truthfulness, true experience than, than, than that. And he didn't elaborate, but, you know, he was having a conversation with his mother. And, and who would you be more likely to have a conversation with on your deathbed than your mother, the person who brought you into the world? That the thought that they might be there to accompany you out, that's a pretty profound um, image and it and has really stuck with me. So he didn't have long uh, stories to tell anymore, but there was enough that it was always worth being there to hear. Didn't he uh, talk about a childhood friend who had died young as well? Billy? He or did. He did. He, uh, that's right. In that last month, he also had um, he would report the presence of this friend named um, Billy. I can't remember his last name. He was one of his friends from high school and um, younger and had also gone to World War II, but he'd only gotten as far as Miami and, and contracted an illness and died. And my dad was, you know, this all came out just, just before he died. My dad was really concerned about how his parents would be taking uh, that loss of their only son. And um, it just felt like that, that young man, Billy, kind of came back in a, um, to accompany my dad as well. I, I can't explain it rationally. It was, it was what he offered. And it, it didn't seem like it could be anything but true, the way it played out. I bet other people in this, I've had that. in this situation have stories like that. It's not uncommon. Anything else, Emily? Is she still there? I, she oh, she seems to be frozen, but I can see a comment here from Emily. The sibling issue is very tricky. My husband's four siblings initially disagreed as to whether their father actually was suffering from dementia. My in-laws were quite adept at hiding the dementia for years. So when they could no longer explain away my father-in-law's behavior, the siblings had to deal with it. Yeah, uh, that's not surprising. Families all have different ways of um, how they want to talk about hard things or not. But our dad was um, pretty uh, open with his experience and he knew um, that something was going on and every loss that he experienced, we knew about. And it was just so hard, you know, when he couldn't drive anymore, when he had to, when, when he had, when that car hit him and he had to go into a, a facility up in New Jersey and he couldn't be home with Mary Jane, that, that he hated that and we knew it. Um, 
So in our situation, he was not, you know, he was leading in terms of, we didn't know what to do about it all. It couldn't really be fixed, but we knew what was, you know, where he needed to be listened to and comforted as best oh, we could. We, we were lucky to have Mary Jane for as long oh as my we gosh. did. But she, really, she really devoted herself to him. She did. She did. Here's a question from John who would like to know what your next project is and will you combine nature and people as you have here? Um, I wish I knew what my project was. I've been writing some shorter essays for um, some anthologies and I'm taking notes. If I thought that I could write something that would substantially alter the course that we're on, that's what I would want to be doing. The course that we're on, um, you know, in terms of the, the world issues. Um, so I'm still musing on that one, John. But as I said, and my husband said last night, I think you should turn to fiction now. <laughs> Just can't make it up. <laughs> the things I see are too uh, interesting. Here's a comment from uh, Andrew who says, Susan's planting a refuge for wildlife is an amazing resource. I had no idea she was one of the writers until I saw it on the screen. So that must have been something you wrote a while back. I wrote that um, with two other people in 1985. It's a good, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a long time. That's a good um, resource for, for Floridians that want to get started with um, native plantings. And hi, Andrew. Andrew's a wonderful nature writer from uh, further up the East Coast from you all down there in Key West. Okay, and someone's telling me that Emily is back, so I can butt out. I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if your dad didn't like the questions I was asking. <laughs> Um, as long as it's about him, he's happy. Uh, um, we do have a question um, from Patricia Kennedy um, that is not about your father, but for um, Susan. Can you suggest other books about the wonders of the natural world? Oh my gosh. There are so many. Um, I would need to know more specifically what you're interested in. And you know what? I think you should put my email in the chat if you have it, Emily, and I'm happy to correspond with her. You know, it just depends what genre you're looking for. There are um, so many, there's, there's nature writers, like you would think of Rachel Carson or Aldo Leopold, and then there's nature memoir writers, and, um, and then there's just pure natural history like David Attenborough or E.O. Wilson. Um, if you would let me know a little bit more about what you want, I promise I'll write back to you. But it's a broad field. I'll be sure to uh, give her your email address. Yeah, sure. Um, and we do have, on a lighter note, um, a question from Michael Nelson, our librarian. Um, when were you roommates, and what was your biggest pet peeve about each other? Oh, my. My sister and I, we yeah. I didn't never have any pet peeves. No pet peeves. <laughs> we were roommates from, Sue, Sue is 11 months and a week older than I am. We were roommates, we were roommates out in cribs in the hall because there was only one bedroom in that first house right up until, I don't know, maybe, maybe 10th grade or something. 10th grade, yeah. And then we were roommates again um, in the sum college summers because we worked, we had, a, we had a crazy job. We were working in a hospital in Wilmington, Delaware. Wilmington, Delaware. And there was an abandoned wing of the hospital and they gave us two side-by-side -side dorm rooms. There was nobody else in the whole place. And it was pretty, as I think back, kind of scary. So yeah. we slept in one room and then we had a hot plate in the other room, and then we would go do our shifts. Um, we were training to be uh, nurses' aides, I guess. 
<laughs> moved out of that pretty quick. <laughs> but you're, we've always gotten along. <laughs> Um, okay, I think we have time for just one more question. And um, for both of you, um, can you, are you, do you read while you're writing? And if so, are you, what are you reading right now? You go ahead first. Oh, yeah, I read, I have to read at night or I get the shakes. So uh, <laughs> I, I know some people don't like to read what they write because they feel like it will leak over and they'll steal something. But I, I like to read, for instance, uh, Barbara Ross's Clambake Mysteries. I'll read those and I'll say, oh, that's what I could do. And it's not like I didn't know that already. It's just, it reminds me of the direction I'm going in. And I have been uh, reading lighter this whole pandemic year, which I'm trying to work on with Susan. <laughs> and Barbara Ross is actually on the event tonight. She's an attendee. Oh, hi, Barb. <laughs> <laughs> what about I, you, Sue? I do the same thing. As you know, um, I read before sleeping as well. And um, this whole year, I've been reading Anne Cleves and Louise Penny. As, and I wish they would come out with more right away because that those are my favorite nighttime reading. Also, um, because in the daytime, I'm reading all the time for, for my writing. So, you know, it's, it's, it's always nonfiction and it's always kind of heavy. So I, at night, I, I just want to read fiction, almost always. One of my favorite, favorite, favorite uh, nonfiction writers right now is um, a British writer named Robert McFarlane. And he writes about um, English, Scottish um, trails and wild places. And boy, he is. So sometimes I read people like him just to get in the flow for my own work because he uses language. And I always underline when I read he uses language in a way that I would love to be able to do and aspire to. It looks like you have a lot of people who agree with you on the chat. Loving Robert. <laughs> Loving Robert McFarland. Oh, you know him? Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah, he's, he's not saying. And Helen McDonald, um, also an English writer. Uh, she Her latest book is Desperate Flights, and that's right on the top of my pile right now. I like the poets too. And I'm reading uh, a memoir that my sister gave me for Christmas. Uh, no, it's not a memoir, it's a biography of Adrian Rich. It's the new biography of Adrian Rich. And, and that's a good one too. To talk about women role models. Okay, anything else, Emily, before we? Um, we've got a lot of people thanking you for your time and what a great chat it was, but I think that that covers it for our questions. Thank you so much. They didn't blow us off for the alarm clock stunt. No, well, we'll hear about that later. That was Michael. <laughs> Mike, Michael dreaded that we were going to somehow have a you can't, you can't manage with ghosts. There's nothing you can do there about it. There is not a thing you can do, especially in Key West. Right? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Emily, and thank you, Sue, for joining us. It was oh, I love coming to the Key West Library, and I, I hope I can come back again in person. Yes, next time. Okay. And uh, don't thank you, Bob Gold, for uh, leading us through oh, this yes. complicated webinar process. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a few things to be, as we wrap up, don't forget that uh, Susan's book and all of our um, visitors' books are available at Books and Books and also at the library. Our next event will be on February 15th and we'll be featuring much acclaimed author Lily King, who is winning all the prizes for her writers and lovers and uh, her Let's see, her father-in-law is on the board. So we had a little in in getting her to come. And she'll be interviewed by our own favorite local writer, Judy Bloom. So make sure you mark that one down. 
And also to tell you that our YouTube video of this event will be available tomorrow. And if you go to the lobby page for the event, you will see donate links and also a spot to join the friends. So we would love to have you all. Thank you so much for supporting us.